Welcome to the 12th International Carnivorous Plan Conference. <laughs> I'm going to try and not hold it. I am David Collinsworth. I'm the uh, co-owner and general manager of California Carnivores. It's been my, you know, lifetime dream come true to get to run California Car Carnivores with Peter every single day, six days a week, anyways. <laughs> Especially with this conference, it's felt more like seven, but here we go. Um, basically, just, I'm going to let Peter do uh, the main intro or everything, but just really quick, I did want to introduce Daniela Rebecca. Is she in here, or did she go away? She went away. She's solving our problems. <laughs> but if you see Daniela Rebecca in her cute black dress, thank her so much for all the extra work that she's put in. It really wouldn't have happened without her. And uh, she also had to have half of her thyroid removed two weeks ago um, in a surprise operation. And she still was back to work a week later to pull this all together for everybody. So give her a big hug and a thank you. Thank you, Daniela. And we are running a little bit tiny bit behind. Um, so we don't have time to introduce everyone probably, but it's Pablo Ramudo here. Is Pablo yet? No, Pablo, okay. Well, he's the president of our um, Bay Area Carnivorous Plant Society. And then um, we will just introduce uh, Arthur and Gina over there. Gina is our vice president. Arthur is our treasurer. Those of you who are going on the field trip, give Gina a big giant hug because she is like the field trip lady. It would not happen without her. Um, and I think with no further ado, I'm going to introduce the famous Peter D'Amato to give our opening address. I asked them, uh, what do they want me to say <laughs> in this introduction, you know? And they said, oh, just babble the way you usually do. <laughs> um, I thought about, you know, gee, I could talk about a lot of the famous people we've run across uh, with California carnivores. Um, but when I went through the list of famous personalities, most of them turned out to be infamous. Um, <laughs> Famous media types thrown in jail for lying to the FBI, <laughs> murderers, mass killers. Um, so I thought I would give a little overview as to how we got from Darwin to here. Um, it all pretty much started in the mid 1800s. Uh, we had Charles Darwin, Chuck, and all of his little <laughs> friends. This was the time when uh, natural history was, was being learned and science was beginning. And not only Charles Darwin, but there were many other naturalists who were looking into the natural world and finding these weird plants that we call carnivorous. And of course, it was Charles Darwin's first book, Insectivorous Plants, that accumulated a lot of this information but particularly his own experiments, uh, particularly with sundews and Venus fly traps, um, that really proved that there were flora that ate animals and insects. At the same time, in the middle 1800s, horticulture started to be developed. We had the big nurseries in England, like Veatch Nurseries, and Hugh Lowe and Son. Uh, here in the States, uh, we had George Such Nurseries in New Jersey. A lot of these plants that were being discovered, uh, like Nepenthes, Saracenia, uh, of course the famous Venus flytrap, a lot of the times when people who were wealthy, as the middle class and the upper classes were growing, they didn't even know these plants were actually carnivorous. Um, it wasn't until Darwin's book came out that this was proven to be a fact. Um, the heyday of the Victorian age 
with carnivorous plants was mostly for the wealthy. Uh, greenhouses were built, wealthy people not only were landscaping beautiful estates with uh, horticultural uh, discoveries and creations, you know, trees and things like that. Um, if you ever want to read about the subjects, it's, it's utterly fascinating to read about the history, for instance, of beach nurseries. Um, I also really enjoyed reading Hugh Lowe's uh, diaries of his trips to like Mount Kinabalu. Um, Hugh Lowe was the son of Hugh Lowe, who um, owned Hugh Lowe and Company. And he was like 25 years old when he discovered plants like Nepenthes Raja. Um, this all happened during the 1840s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Then things were going pretty well. You know, even beach nurseries sold plants like Cephalotus, um, Saracenia. You know, they were most famous for their Nepenthes. But then the World Wars came. And from about the 18 teens through the 1940s, carnivorous plants virtually disappeared. Um, the only other book that finally came out after Darwin's book, which came out around 1870 or so, uh, was Francis Ernest Lloyd's book in 1942, The Carnivorous Plants. I've written an article about him called Lloydy in the Carnivorous Plant newsletter uh, several years ago. Uh, his granddaughter came into our nursery and I almost fell over. And uh, nobody, none of us, uh, the old timers like Joe Masremus, and we, we didn't even really know who Lloyd was. We thought actually for a while that he was German because he actually did a lot of work in Germany. But Lloyd published his book accumulating a lot of the knowledge about carnivorous plants from Darwin's time until the 1940s. Um, he passed away a few years after the book came out. He passed away in 1946. But carnivorous plants were still so obscure. And even Lloyd's book, being published during World War II, had very few photographs in it. There were some small black and white photos they had at the back of the book. And uh, that was really the only major literature on the carnivorous plants. Until things started to change um, in the early 60s. And I account a lot of this change to Dr. Paul Zoll. He wrote, and I also wrote an article about Paul Zoll and his family. Um, I had asked my uh, office manager at the time, I said, his daughter, Ida, must still be alive, and his son. Paul Zoll was the most prominent National Geographic writer from the 40s until the early 70s. He wrote more articles than anybody else did for Nat Geo. His articles were so fascinating because he would take his family out on a lot of these expeditions to see coral reefs, volcanoes. And in 1961, well, what the first article that actually mentioned carnivorous plants was a delightful one in the mid-50s when he was working at the Museum of Natural History in New York City. He wanted his children, his little kids, to be exposed to nature. So he started with a goldfish. And he wrote this wonderful article with incredible color photographs, uh, which weren't that common in National Geographic in the <coughs> mid-50s, about this menagerie that he ended up having in his apartment in New York lizards and frogs, and he had a little terrarium, there was a photograph with a Venus flytrap, a little purple pitcher plant, and I think it was probably Drosera capillaris. The only place you could get carnivorous plants in the United States back then was really the uh, Carolina Biological Supply Company, which is still in existence, and it's an amazing company. But at the time back then, when people ordered Venus flytraps or other carnivorous plants, they would just go out into the field and dig them up. Back then, they were certainly a hell of a lot more abundant than they are now. And in fact, uh, Paul Zoll wrote his first article on carnivorous plants in 1961. 
called Plants That Eat Insects, and it changed everything. National Geographic was popular around the world, and here in the States, you go to any dentist office and the magazines were lying there. I was in New Jersey at the time, I was a kid, and I tried growing Venus flytraps that I ordered out of Famous Monsters magazine. <laughs> and considering that there was no real directions, and I thought that they were tropical, I put them in December when the bulbs arrived next to my first parlor palm that I had on a north-facing window next to a heater in my bedroom. And of course, a few little leaves came up, and then they just rotted and died. And uh, the following spring, uh, I volunteered to do an article on the Venus flytrap um, for my uh, science class. And this is around 1967 or so. Um, this kid behind me, and I lived in southern New Jersey on the, on the Jersey Shore, he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, I know where all these carnivorous plants grow. Um, and I thought, well, you know, Venus flytraps must come from Madagascar or someplace. Well, he took me to this bog that was right in the middle of town at a lake. And I had no idea what these things were. They looked like they came from outer space. It was just before school ended in May. And we dug up a couple of the plants. We took them to school and our teachers didn't know what they were. I found Paul Zoll's article in my school library, and I must have read that thing a hundred times. And I was astonished to find out that right here in America, Venus flytraps grew in North Carolina. What I found and was shown were purple pitcher plants and sundews, um, and it changed my life. I couldn't believe that New Jersey had these wonderful bogs with these weird plants in them. So Paul Zoll's article really uh, kick-started the modern carnivorous plant hobby. Now, all during this time, of course, there were always botanists and people in universities studying carnivorous plants and doing occasional articles, mostly scientific, on them. There was one nursery which also dug up carnivorous plants from the wild starting in the late 50s, and they finally went defunct uh, probably in the 1980s mostly because they were boycotted by carnivorous plant enthusiasts. And that was Peter Paul's nursery, James and Patricia Pietro Paolo. I never wrote about them or mentioned them even in the Savage Garden because they were nasty people. And they also <laughs> removed uh, many Saracenia oreophila from the wild. Um, and they were like, indifferent to it at the time. They would pay people to dig up plants in the southeast and then they would mail them out. But they did write a very interesting little book uh, which gave some good basic information about how to keep Venus flytraps and things alive. Then, <clears throat> Paul Saul also wrote an article in 64 about Nepenthes on Mount Kinabalu in Borneo. And that was where modern growers suddenly realized that these tropical pitcher plants, for the most part, required things like cooler nights, chillier temperatures. And then the few people who were growing them started to have the plants thrive. They realized they were not necessarily lowland, you know, stifling heat plants. It was really quite a time of information coming out. And of course, there were no computers at the time. There was no internet. Um, so those two Zoll articles really helped to get people interested in carnivorous plants. Then the big change came in the 1970s. That was when Joe Mesremus and Dr. Schnell Joe Mesrim is here in California, Dr. Schnell back in Virginia. They got in touch with each other, and I wrote an article about both of them and how they started the carnivorous plant newsletter. Um, the article is very funny at times, considering how they were counting pennies to produce these little mimeographed, you know, newsletters. And it first circulated in the States, but then Australians became interested. <coughs> 
some people in South Africa, and of course in Europe. And finally, there was like a network where people could exchange seed as well as plants. They started to write about their experiments with growing the plants. This all started around 1978. If you ever have the time to go into the archives of the International Carnivorous Plant Society, reading a lot of these early journals is absolutely fascinating. Um, how do you grow a dewy pine? Uh, Leo Song, you know, he tried growing it like a bog plant. They would live for about two years and die. And then we finally had people go out in the field and see what they really grew in, uh, that it was a rather dry climate. Um, all this information started to uh, spread and people started to succeed in actually growing the plants. I was really surprised to learn when I was uh, in high school, um, Joe Mazremus and Dr. Schnell told me that beside a few people at some universities, I had some of the largest carnivorous plant collections in the country. And I only grew maybe 20, 30 varieties. Saracenia, you know, Venus flytrap, some sundews. Um, but the hobby then started to change and grow. And also in the 70s, Don Schnell published his book, Carnivorous Plants of the U.S. and Canada, uh, a very good book. And it was the first one that talked about carnivorous plants in North America. In Europe, there were growers like Marcel Lukoffel in France. But it was Adrian Slack who wrote the first really good book on how to cultivate carnivorous plants back around 1980. Um, and then he came out with insect eating plants and how to grow them. And he owned Marston Exotics in England. Adrian unfortunately passed away just a couple of months ago. Um, he had had a stroke after his second book came out. But that book was a small book, but it gave some of the finest horticultural information on how to grow carnivorous plants and keep them alive. It helped me greatly. We also started to see books like Alan Lowry's collection on carnivorous plants of Australia, which was another whole world of carnivorous plants that people in Europe and America just weren't familiar with. So, we started the Bay Area Carnivorous Plant Society um, in the 1980s, and there were six of us uh, that started out. Uh, Jeff Wong, uh, the late Jeff Wong, one of the greatest growers in the world, and a personality we dearly miss. Um, and a lot of the, uh, and Chuck Powell, uh, he also started the Bay Area Society with me and Jeff. And of course, we had famous Joe Mazremus, you know, living in Livermore. Um, we started to have a lot of fun uh, growing plants. We were able to order plants from England. I got plants from Adrian Slack. We were getting seed and tubers from Australian carnivorous plant growers. And slowly, the hobby started to grow. Um, in the 1980s, uh, that was when, well, I'm sorry, the 1990s. Two things happened that really changed the carnivorous plant hobby. And that was tissue culture and the internet. The changes that happened overnight, well, not quite overnight, but pretty quickly. Um, tissue cultured plants had been around since the 1940s, mostly things like corn, you know, uh, they would propagate these in test tubes and stuff. And then they started to do house plants in the 1970s and 80s. And then it was AgriStarts in Florida, Mike Rink, who approached me shortly after I opened California Carnivores in 1989. Uh, it was around 1992 that he visited, and he said he wanted to tissue culture carnivorous plants. And I thought, what's tissue culture? <laughs> Well, that changed a lot. Plants which took so long to propagate uh, could now be produced en masse. It was Bob Hanrahan here in the States <clears throat> who was the first guy 
to actually propagate carnivorous plants for sale rather than dig them up out of the wild. And it was a revelation to me because I, you know, back then, if you ordered from Carolina Biological Supply Company, you just took it for granted that the plants were being removed from the wild. But at the time, the devastation of the wetlands just wasn't as acute as it was rapidly becoming. In the 1970s, for instance, the green swamp outside of Wilmington, 70 miles in diameter. You could virtually not step anywhere without stepping on Venus flytraps. It took them 20 years, but they drained it, most of it, to grow slash pine. Um, places like the Nature Conservancy are now trying to fill in all of these canals that drain the land. They're trying to return some of the original habitat. But it was habitat destruction that so devastated carnivorous plants, especially here in the United States. So Bob Hanrahan came around, and plants were starting to become more and more you know, available. Um, in 19, uh, I opened California Carnivores in 1989, and I published this little booklet. The first one was four pages long. Then I wrote this 16-page booklet, and we sold it for $2 each, uh, about general growing guide for some of the major genuses of carnivorous plants. We sold this book for $2, and in four years, I sold 10,000 copies. A guy in, uh, who was an editor for 10 Speed Press in Berkeley, he was at a Christmas party, and he heard people giggling in a corner, and he went over and they had my little booklet, and I had a few jokes in it. Um, he wasn't familiar with carnivorous plants at all, but you know, he read this little booklet, and then he came up and visited California carnivores in January, when everything was dormant, right after one of the worst windstorms we ever had, and the greenhouse was devastated. And he came in with his family, and he saw some waterlogged books, because the roof blew off. Uh, Adrian Slack's book, Don Schnell's book. But he said, what, carnivor what carnivorous plant books are there? And I said, well, there aren't any now. You know, they're out of print. And he left, didn't tell me who he was. But he called the next day and said, uh, I'd like to offer you a contract to write a book on carnivorous plants. So I wrote The Savage Garden. It was a lot of fun. Um, I wanted a book that I needed when I was 14 years old. To my utter amazement, it won the Book of the Year Award from the American Horticultural Society. And it was revised uh, in 2013. Um, it's been in print now for 20 years. Uh, the first version of it went through 14 printings, and currently the revised version has gone through five printings. Many, many other books have come out since The Savage Garden. Um, I had to build an extra room in my house just to have all of Stuart McPherson's red <laughs> Daniela got a hernia lifting a case of his books at one point. The amount of information on the internet is overwhelming. But just to go through these books that all these guys and a few gals have accumulated is astonishing. Um, and all the new plants that have been discovered and will continue to be discovered. Uh, Nepenthes, when I wrote the first version of my book, there were like 60 Nepenthes now. What is it now? Over 200? The island of Palawan off the Philippines that Stuart and all of his little friends have been, you know, <laughs> exploring. They could tackle maybe one or two mountains on an expedition. There's 200 of these mountains. They've explored about four or five of them. And probably every mountain has a new species of Nepenthes. Who would have thunk it, you know? It's been just absolutely amazing. What is the future with carnivorous plants? Well, we have this wonderful array of people. Um, I've seen such changes in the hobby. I should mention one thing.
I insisted when the revised version of my book came out, I wanted a woman's hand on the cover. Uh, Lo Hodges, who was uh, the special events coordinator for the Conservatory of Flowers, it was her hand. We took photos, Patrick Hollingsworth did. Um, it took six hours just to get this cover photo with different nail polishes. And <laughs> the red nails looked too whorish, you know. We had a lot of trouble with the goddamn cockroach that kept escaping until we anesthetized it. I wanted a woman's hand on because when I started California Carnivores in 89, there were no women growing carnivorous plants, except maybe Judith Finn at the University of California at Berkeley. She was an angel, had a very nice collection, part of the Bay Area Society. She retired a few years ago down to Santa Barbara. Our customer base now is about 50% women. Um, carnivorous plants finally started to be appreciated, not because they were eating things, but because they are so damn beautiful. And I've also seen changes, too, in uh, minorities. We never had Hispanics come into the nursery back in the 90s. Now we have a lot of them. They're becoming more affluent. They're getting more interested in horticulture. Of course, Asians have always been into ornamental plants. And in fact, the first society was started in Japan around 1948, after their collections were devastated during World War II. Uh, so where is the future of carnivorous plants going? Um, discovering more plants, uh, producing more through tissue culture, and of course, hybridizing. Adrian Slack predicted over 30 years ago that pinguicula could become as famous as St. Paulia, the African violet. All those African violets you see were produced by two different plants, both having bluish flowers. And look at them now, all these regressed genes. Adrian Slack made this prediction back when there were only 30 butterworts known in the world, and now it's approaching 200. When you visit California carnivores later today, you'll see the work that Damon has been doing, and several other people around the world, especially in Europe. They're producing such fantastic uh, butterworts that everybody used to ignore 30 years ago, you know? Um, so that's where I see the hobby going, is hybridization, uh, letting people know that these plants are very easy to grow once you have the correct habitat. And I better stop babbling. That's great. Any questions? Okay. Nope. Oh, I, I have a question. Yes. Peter, did your hand model get any royalties for being on the cover? <laughs> she got an acknowledgement in the book. <laughs> and a big, wet, sloppy kiss. Lo has a darling Tonya tattoo from her shoulder blades all the way down her leg. That was one article I did want to do one, uh, at one point was uh, carnivorous plant tattoos. <laughs> and it may be something that we may still want to get on Facebook or on the International Society, have people send in photographs of their carnivorous plant tattoos. Uh, okay. Thank you. I thought I had the phone on. Yeah.